Shut up. Don't stop now. Welcome to Android Authority on Air, the original Android Hangout show on Google Plus. I'm Derek Ross. I'm Scott Anderson. I'm Dan Charlton. And I'm Jonathan Franklin. And as you can see in here, Scott Anderson is back. He hasn't been on the show in oh, I think three weeks ago. The last two weeks he was he was absent. So we haven't seen him in a few weeks. For those of you that are fans of the show, you will be happy to know that the reason Scott wasn't here for the past three weeks is he was actually attending a seminar. Um, he was attending a seminar on how to make your bed. And if you look directly behind Scott, you will see the fruits of his labor have been accomplished. He, he has successfully made the bed. This is an Android Authority on air first. Um, I don't even know if I can go on. I'm ecstatic right now. I came back a changed person. I just want to say that much. <laughs> well, we're, the the YouTube comments and the Google Plus comments about the bed being made have all been invalidated. So, thank you, Scott, for at least giving us something to talk about for the first. Invalidated, and it really got to me, and so I wanted to make a change. Well, that, that's 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 good, man. I'm I'm happy for you. Okay, so. So besides beds being made and Scott being back from the land of Oz, uh, we're going to hit you up with some ecosystem news. Uh, you know, a, a few things happened the, the last day of I.O. we didn't have a chance to report on, so we're going to hit you with that. Uh, we're going to talk about some rumors in the Android ecosystem. Cards, all the things, at least in terms of uh, UI for apps. And then uh, some device news, you know, some uh, Galaxy S4 news, a little bit of HTC One stuff, and... Uh, some carrier stuff like Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> All right, so so John, uh, IO came in and is gone. Did we did we miss anything last week? A few things from the uh, the keynote and so forth. Yeah, a couple of talks after you know ours was on Thursday, and they gave a couple of talks afterward. But um, there were quite a few hints at an upcoming version of Android, which is most likely to be called 4.3. Um, one thing to really note was. A lot of the talks were very heavily oriented toward design and teaching developers good design principles, why they designed Android, you know, in its current state, the way that it is, and really how to make your apps just really fast and fluid. But um, another couple of things that really did get shown off and are coming to Android that they pointed out were one is there's actually finally an official library to implement the action bar on. Um, versions of Android that don't have, you know, Honeycomb on forward where it had that library baked in. So it'll work very similarly to uh, Action Bar Sherlock, which most of the developers have gone with. And the um, IO 2013 application was actually written using that library, so if you want an indication of how that does, and usually they open source the IO app afterwards, so you can kind of see what they did with it. The other one was, uh, it was Romain Guy and Chet Hass's uh, Android graphics performance talk. And the whole time they were talking, they were just kind of jokingly saying an upcoming Android release that shall remain unnamed. And they gave a couple of hints at it. Maybe it's not a full version increase. Maybe it's, you know, just an iterative thing. And uh, they did cover some architectural things. And two things that they really mentioned was that the uh, system is automatically going to reorder and merge GPU tasks, which is something that developers have had to do. And basically what that does is instead of loading, like, a bitmap, then text, then a PNG, then, you know, it brings all those commands together or to load all the images, all the text in blocks. So it reduces the number of commands, and the GPU doesn't have to change states as much. So it really makes the application a lot faster and more fluid. The other was that they're introducing some multi-threading into the actual rendering pipeline so that you can use, instead of, you know, one thread, you'll have four cores to do things like drop shadows and basically more butter in the next, you know, it, this is just the next kind of evolutionary step as far as them trying to make Android a lot smoother and faster and easier for developers to get a really smooth feeling really good performing app. And a couple of the web talks, uh, we know that Blink Engine was something that they forked from WebKit and they're working on it very quickly. The question was how fast it was going to evolve. Well, they've already stripped out 8.8 .8 million 
lines of code from Blink Engine. So yeah, yeah. moving extremely fast. And it's good that they're not having to kind of keep up with all the legacy WebKit stuff because WebKit is spread across so many types of devices. But they're really it's showing that they're really serious about making Chrome capable of evolving in the direction they want it to and be a real competitor to, you know, WebKit, which is on Safari and you know, so many other different browsers. But yeah. Eight point eight million lines of code, that's crazy. Well, you know, and they're 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 thinning it down, which can only make it faster. If, you know, they're getting rid of unneeded code, so Chrome is going to get faster. And I don't know about you guys, but loves me some fast web browsing. So yeah. no, absolutely, it's I, easier for the developer too. You know, they don't have to maintain as much. So exactly. No, I think Blink is a really really good step for Google to take and forking WebKit, getting out from underneath the shadow of Apple. Who Apple maintains WebKit the same way Oracle maintains their stuff. Which yeah. is to say, it's there. They kind of half-heartedly support it, so that they can run around the world bragging about how they're in charge of it. <laughs> but it doesn't really go anywhere, or do anything, and isn't all that great for people. But they're kind of stuck using it, right? Like it's the same thing with Java and with Open Office that's now defunct because LibreOffice killed it, right? Like Blink is going to kill WebKit because yeah. Google is actually going to maintain it and push it and drive it. And realistically, Google knows a crap load more about how to serve the web than Apple ever will. Because that's what Google does, right? Like, they're primarily an internet company. Apple is not. They trade on the internet, they work with the internet, they you know interface with it, and obviously do very well with it, but they're primarily a hardware company. That's their main focus. That's what they've always been. They've made hardware and some software, but you know, they're not an internet company. Do you think Apple will start supporting it more so now that Google is coming out with a competitive or could, could potentially be more competitive than WebKit itself? No, because I don't think that Apple gains anything out of being behind WebKit. Yeah. They, they gain some compatibility, which is nice, but Google's going to make sure that Blink runs just fine on Mac. If they can leverage Blink into a iOS app that's even better for consumers. So I, I was pretty much stuck with WebKit there. So ultimately, if Blink prevails and Apple keeps supporting WebKit, they will be supporting a dying, you know, a dying breed, if you will. Well, I mean, look at it, right? Safari is not exactly a popular desktop browser. Even on Macs, people use Firefox, people use Chrome. Safari is the default, and then they replace it with something that they like better, just like on Windows, where it comes with Internet Explorer, and then they replace it with something they like better. The difference is the population of Windows computers is vastly larger than the population of Macs, so Safari is not really all that used. True. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and, you know, it's not like the outside for Apple, is forcing you to use it like you do with Internet Explorer either. Yeah, the downside for Apple is in terms of statistics reporting. It's one of the things that you know, we keep seeing is all these reports about how people are far more engaged with their iOS devices than they are with Android devices. Part of the reasons the statistics say that is because the people who are analyzing the stats look at WebKit stats, right? They see, well, this many millions of people connected to the web from a mobile device running WebKit. Therefore, it's Safari. Doesn't matter if it's running WebKit on Android, it's still getting lumped in as Safari. So... If browsers were more accurately reporting that they're blank and therefore Google and not WebKit and therefore Apple, I think that people would get a much better picture of how few people actually rely on Safari. Okay. Definitely good. They're they're already experimenting with the engine too. So oil pan was one thing that they're. Uh, All right. So John, did we have any other uh, tidbits the, the past week from the the ecosystem? Um, they talked a little bit more about Hangouts. Um, this was on Google+. Plus. This wasn't really on the uh, talks at I.O., but people were concerned about the move to Hangouts after Gmail and making outgoing calls, and uh, they basically clarified that outgoing calls are coming to Hangouts very soon, and it's also going to be the future of Google Voice, which is very good news, because Google Voice is just something that hasn't gotten a lot of love lately, and... Uh, it's interesting lately, that, that they're going to... The last several years. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting that they're... I, I mean, I, okay, I understand making an outgoing call. Okay, so that, that doesn't make it a Google Voice replacement. I mean, you, you know, you need greetings for calls. You need... They were talking about the, uh, the 
integrated, you could already make calls from Gmail, and you can't do it right now. It's yeah, like, yeah, but I, I'm wondering how, you know, I, I, I saw the post where they said, you know, in case you haven't figured it out, you know, Hangouts is the future of Google Voice. So does that mean that you're going to be able to make an outgoing call and, and that's it? Or are we talking about, like, the two of them all coming together where you're going to get some type of, uh, you know, answering voicemail system you know you know I, I want to know how deep of integration and uh, that assume, the two are going to bring I have to assume it'll be pretty deeply integrated I mean already you can have voice send your your voicemails transcribed to Gmail mm -hmm. right all of your hangouts are getting logged to Gmail it doesn't seem that difficult to just integrate the both of them right there in Gmail and then as far as the the calls right now while everybody's been up in arms about the outgoing calls incoming calls still come into hangouts Mm -hmm. Right, I've been answering calls on my computer all, all left and right through Hangouts because you know I'm sitting at my desk, I've got a mic. Why wouldn't I? Be? So I mean, those calls things. actually seem to work better than Gmail did. Uh, yeah, I would agree. So I mean, they, right. they definitely still have the calling capacity. It's just the outgoing, and even the outgoing to say it's gone isn't entirely true. You can still place an outgoing call through a Hangout, but you have to start a Hangout first, which means you have to have another participant. Right, it used to be that you could start a hangout just with you and then invite people, and that doesn't seem to be an option anymore either. Do you do you think that they're going to go with voice calling a VoIP way with regards to mobile, just over data? I think that's going to be the direction that carriers eventually go once they all kind of may or may not look like it. They might keep a plan like that, but you know, we're we're eventually going to be doing all our voice over data anyway, so. Yeah, I, I, I mean, would think that they would. I mean, to compete with Skype and you know Facebook Messenger and so forth. I mean, all the competitors are, are doing it. Yeah. As far as voice integration goes, I don't think so. Because right now they essentially already have that functionality with with Hangouts, with the Hangouts app. Right? It's just video only instead of video and voice. But that's definitely VoIP when you're doing it. You know, for the audio part of it. Mm -hmm. So the thing that they can do with voice that Skype and Facebook and all the others can't do is they can leverage actual phone numbers and the, like the actual phone network that's been in place for decades, right? With voice, you can call out to other landlines. You can do that with Skype, but they charge you for it. Yeah, so it, well, it'll definitely be interesting uh, over the next coming week. You know, so I, I think it'll be, it'll be exciting and definitely something that Google Voice users will want to, you know, keep, a, keep an eye out for. Yeah, I mean, the big thing that, that Google has with voice that they can leverage is they can allow other people to pick up their, you know, your grandmother, pick up her old school telephone because she doesn't have a cell phone because she's, you know, in her 80s and why would she need one? So she picks up her landline phone and dials you and it calls your Hangouts app. Yeah, which or means, they, and it calls you no matter what platform you're on. Exactly. Or but where you're at. Skype and everybody else can't leverage because they can't take incoming calls to a a number, right? A ten-digit phone number, as opposed to your Skype handle or your Facebook handle. Unless you bought a Skype number with a paid version. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, we're we're talking about free. Yeah, you know. yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right, so so let's talk about some more uh, things that came out of IL. Let's talk. Let's talk about some rumors, because you know what? Loves me some rumors because they get the heart beaten. You know, it gets us excited for upcoming products, and you know what? I I don't I like I like I just like it. I just like it. It makes me smile. It puts a smile on my face. So Android and Nexus rumors that came out of IO. So obviously we didn't see a, a new version of Android, but we know it's right around the corner from server logs and so forth. You know, there's all sorts of hints, you know, and uh, <laughs> there's all sorts of different hints and different IO sessions, such as like a Cthulhu type monster from Final Fantasy and all, and, and all the boss powers from the, the slideshow listed like Jelly Bean as a, a power. Key Lime Pie was a, a, a power. And then uh, a, a little bit later on during the design session, you know, there was a uh, um, an Android character uh, sitting on a park bench eating some key lime pie. You know, so Google pretty much did what they do best. and They, they, they trolled us. They teased us. And we love them for it, you know. We, we know that key lime pie is the next uh, iteration name. We don't know when it's coming. We don't know the version number. None of that really matters. The fact that Google played along with us and gave us tidbits of info and Dan Moreau yeah. yelled hollow YOLO during the fireside chat. <laughs> You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it was it was all cool, but but anyway. Yeah. So let's get back to the the. So, a white Nexus four was actually spotted 
at, at I.O. And uh, it was running Android 4.2.1 right now. But as I said, version numbers don't really mean anything. But it was a white Nexus 4, which we've seen leaked all over the place for months. Um, rumor has it that that device will become available or announced on June 10th. And that is also rumored to be the same day that Android 4.3 becomes available. And maybe a Nexus 7 refresh will be maybe made for pre-order or at least announced on that date. And maybe, this is a long shot here, uh, maybe another device. Uh, this past week af after I.O., a Google-branded media streaming device, kind of like a Nexus Q, kind of like a Google TV, a media streaming device passed through the FCC. And, and the neat thing about that is it was actually called Media Player. You know, and uh, the device name was H840 Device. And uh, the model number was H2G2, which yeah, I'm not a fan of this because I, I don't read books, but whatever. Uh, Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy, that's a, uh, a little hat tip to them. So I don't know if it's going to be The rest of the filing was plastered with 42s everywhere. Y yeah, yeah. So is it going to be like a towel we're going to get? I guess that's something big in that. Nah, I'm just well, there's been people speculating that it's essentially a, a Nexus Q. Well, well, yes. That and more. I'm, uh, you know, I'm saying it's that and more because there's been reports that this is going to be heavily focused on gaming, so it's going to be a way for Google to take over the the, the living room. Um, now, let's say all these things happen here in another two weeks or so. Well, it just so happens on June 10th is the first day of Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference. So and Apple doesn't attend. That Apple doesn't attend, yeah. <laughs> but that would that would steal a lot of thunder from WWDC if yeah. Google made all these major announcements of it. You know, a Nexus Four, <laughs> Nexus Seven, uh, an, a, an Android gaming console, or you know, media streaming player, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, all on the same day of that conference. So that'll be pretty interesting if those rumors and speculations do turn out to be true. I'm definitely going to be uh, having my my uh, buttons. And F5 and mouse clicks and all that stuff ready to go on the Play Store that day all day long. Yes, expect <laughs> things to sell out roughly five minutes after they go on to sale. Help, well, and to then help back crash stock the five minutes later and go on five after that. Yeah, so, so you know, in general Nexus uh, device ordering fashion, be sure to press F5 all day long to, you know, <laughs> help crash the servers. You know, because, <laughs> because that's what we do. Um, <laughs> let, let's hope that doesn't happen. But uh, I'm going to be curious if, if we'll see some new devices, if these rumors are... I mean, they're definitely coming. I mean, we, we know that a new device is coming. Uh, you know, it passed through the FCC, so it's just a matter of when. That doesn't necessarily mean it's coming. Oh, it's coming. Lots of things go through the FCC and never see the light of day. It's coming, Dan. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's really it for rumored devices after I.O. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's talk about some stuff we do know about, such as Scott Anderson making his bed and talking about uh, app updates. Yeah, I made my bed. Um, okay, app updates. Uh, Chrome beta for Android has kind of been on a tear lately since I.O. Uh, it's gotten two updates a uh, lot quicker. Uh, the biggest notable one was today. Uh, Google translates whenever you come across like a page that's written in German or a language that is not your native language. Uh, it will bring up a bar from the bottom asking if you want to translate it. Pretty cool, and it works beautifully. Um, still a little bit of bugs with dis displaying the um, you know translated text, in my opinion, but uh, pretty cool. Also, full screen on tablets. Nice. Um, which is nice, and it was on phones before, but it's also nice to have on tablets, you know, more screen space, be able to do more. Um, support for a full screen a a API, uh, it's nice. Uh, also that Google Plus integration, the scroll down thing, a little bit buggy on the most recent uh, app. And also a new graph showing your estimated bandwidth savings. Uh, before it just showed you how much data you actually saved, um, now it has a little bit of more of like a, a, the system level UI of how much data you've used, kind of like that. 
And then uh, mobile friendly error pages, kind of cool. Also, the new tab is on the top. You don't have to click. Uh, you don't have to hit the tab button and then click new tab. It's actually yeah. one less tap. It, it, yeah, which that is was new. annoying. Yeah. That was really annoying. Um, and then also, a lot of apps, Derek, uh, received card UI updates. Yeah, so card all the things, as I said earlier, um, you know, the Google Play Store has a card UI. Google Plus, if you're rocking Google Plus right now on the web watching us, you know, has cards all over the place. So Google's moving towards this, you know, card UI kind of focused off of Google Now, that you know, that, that type of a UI. And, and apps... Obviously, apps, they stole this idea from iOS 7. <laughs> well, apps are... <laughs> come on, Dan. We're, we're getting questions about why you're so anti-Apple here. Don't be saying stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not the one pushing the rumors about how everybody stole this idea for right, so, so, UI. So, so, anyway, so anyway, so, so card <laughs> UI has come to a bunch of apps besides the Google Play Store. Well, play music. Play music's gorgeous. We got that last week, obviously. We got books last week. And, yeah, and, and since then, uh, we got magazines. Uh, you know, YouTube actually was updated before I.O., and uh, Google Earth, and they don't really have cards so much, so much, but they have the new slide-out menu with the actual menu buttons at the top depicting it's an actual menu. And then uh, Google Shopping got updated. There's just and uh, Google Drive got updated as well. Uh, you know, these are the, the Google Drive update is all is just as awesome as the music update is when it, when it comes to cards. Uh, Scott, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Uh, the slide-out UIs. No, the uh, Google Drive. You were talking about how you were a huge fan of it earlier. Oh, yeah. Huge fan of it and huge fan of where they're going with it. Uh, it had a large update to version 1.2, and uh, basically you have a new grid view that makes it easier to find your files. A uh, new quick preview lets you view photos and other files from within the app. You can scan documents, receipts, and letters for safekeeping in Drive, basically with your camera or uh, a previous file. You can also download a copy of files to your local device. Oh, finally. Yeah, which is very nice. Uh, spreadsheets, if you use spreadsheets on a, a tablet or your phone, uh, the editor now supports changing fonts, colors, and alignment, which I don't know why it didn't have this before, but yeah. Uh, you can view the properties of files from within the editors, which is very nice. Nice and uh, lots of bug fixes and visual improvements and, in my opinion, performance improvements as well. It's, so they, uh, there's, a, there's a new feature called Scan. I mean, really, it's just take a picture. But, but it's called Scan. So I saw, I, saw, I, I saw a neat use case for this today. So let's say you uh, want to keep all of your receipts, you know, for tax purposes or whatever, for uh, checkbook tracking, or however you want to do it. Uh, you you want to keep all your receipts. Well, you just scan them into Google Drive. So you take your receipt, you open up Drive, you hit the little scan button, and then basically you just take a picture, really. You, you take a picture with it, and it you know scans it. But it actually does scan it because it does OCR. So in, in OCR, it, that's fantastic. Yeah, so, so, so now that receipt becomes searchable. So if you say, when the hell did I buy that, uh, I don't know, uh, lawn chair? You know, you, 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 now you can go into Drive and just search for lawn chair, and then it'll find the receipt for you. So it, 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 it is a scan, but it's a you know it's a picture. For viewers scan. that don't know, OCR is optical optical character recognition. It's typically in enterprise grade scanning software, and it's usually pretty pricey. Well, yeah, so, so well, it, it'll scan your image not, for you, your receipt. So I mean, you don't have to use it for a receipt, but that was a neat use case, which okay. I I might try to do. So yeah, you can search for the text, and the text becomes searchable. But a true OCR allows you to edit it. No, that's not true. It, it is an editable file, an editable file. OCR doesn't make it editable. OCR just makes it searchable. OC, mm. OC, OCR just translate. It doesn't. Okay. It, it depends on it. what you're outputting the format in. If you're putting it out as a PDF, that's not editable because it's a PDF. That's editable true. if you have a full version of Adobe. Either way, it has OCR support. We don't need to yes. get into semantics if it, what it is or isn't. It has OCR support. I don't know if it's actually editable. I didn't try that, but I did try scanning a receipt after I saw the article online from, uh, I don't remember where, but it was a pretty neat idea. So you just they just create a, a folder called receipts, and they scan them all in there. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, then Google Play magazines got updated, card UI, new slide-out menu, bug fixes. Uh, Flickr updated their app, new UI for the app. Uh, also, 
one terabyte of storage space, which is freaking awesome. Yes, sort of. Isn't it still just for pictures and videos, though? Yes. But think about it. Is there a file size limit, like, per file? I do not know if there's a file size limit, but if you're looking for a, a photo locker, for you know, if you're a photographer, I mean, Google Plus gives you 15 gig. So one terabyte, that's... It's a lot of space, but it seems to me like it's overkill for, for the way it's limited, right? Like, it's not just a generic terabyte of space of online cloud storage. It's, it's just for just photos, picture. yeah. You know, but if, if you're taking uh, multiple, multiple, you know... I don't know how big they, you know, 50 meg uh, raw files. Yeah, I'm sure you can fill that up pretty quickly if you're an avid photographer. Yeah, I mean, that's why I wonder if there's a file size limit, because I know you can put videos there, so, like, if you have home videos or DVDs that you put into your computer, if you could store those up there. But, I mean, that's potentially a gigabyte plus file size. Yeah, definitely. That would be, well, be interesting to if check If you could do out. that, that's definitely worth it. Back up your whole video library. And the app got a really nice update too. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I I'd recommend checking it out if you're into pictures. Um, then also uh, the Opera browser uh, got a UI overhaul and it left the beta stage, so that's big news. And uh, it's really nice. It's I mean it's a very popular browser for Android, and uh, I know it's a lot of uh, go it's a go-to browser for a lot of people that I know. Um, Chrome is becoming more more so, you know, acceptable. Um, but it's good news, and it's pretty cool. All right, guys, we're going to talk about some devices here. Um, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and drop it in the comments or watch in the comments on YouTube as well as, as Google+. Plus. Um, and, and, yes, uh, we have been getting a lot of comments, actually, about uh, Scott's bed being made, uh, at least like three or four or five people comment about it. So yes, he, he has made his bed. If you're tuning in late to the show, he, that's why he hasn't been here for about three weeks now. He actually has been on a, uh, a retreat. A, 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 he's been going to a, a seminar daily on how to uh, properly make his bed. So he's shaking it his free, head. It was a free seminar. <laughs> he's shaking his head, but he knows he damn well went there. It was free. All right, so, so let's talk about some devices. Uh, so if you're on Big Red, like this guy, and like another guy in here. Um, uh -huh. Ha ha. Yeah. Ha ha. You're on Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can now get the Samsung Galaxy S4 as of today. Yay! It's uh, $199 with a two year contract if you don't like contracts. Uh, it's $649. Um, you can also actually get it on Amazon Wireless and save 20 bucks with a two-year contract, so you can get it for $179. Uh, I don't know how long that special is available, but it is now, so if you want the S4 and you're on Verizon, your contract's up, or you're going to be a new customer, you can save 20 bucks and get it from Amazon. Do you know if it's new only or if it's for renewals as well? It's for renewals, new contracts, and nice. for new customers. You can save 20 bucks. Nice. A lot, so, of, those, yeah. a lot of times those special deals are for yeah. new customers only. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you might as well save 20 bucks if you can uh, on Amazon. Definitely. You know, they just yeah, might as well offer to renewals because you get another two years of service, right? Yeah. And so um, Samsung announced the developer edition for both Verizon and AT&T, but that's, yeah, yeah, that's really irrelevant if you're into you know, rooting and ramen, which why would you want the developer version if you weren't? So you go ahead and save yourself a couple hundred dollars. Because Dan Rosenberg, which he's really well known for cracking Motorola devices, he took his knowledge and applied it to the Samsung Galaxy S4. And you can now use his program his, called Loki to unlock the bootloader of the Samsung Galaxy S4. So now he came up with this. He came up with this process prior to Verizon releasing it. And yeah. uh, Derek, you want to elaborate on why? Yeah. So he. So he uh, he actually got it to work, I believe, on the AT&T variant, but he didn't release it because he didn't want Verizon to do anything crazy beforehand <laughs> and patch the bug or you know, the exploit that he the used. Nice. So, so he waited until the Verizon version hit the store, and they said, okay, now I'll release it because you can't patch it now. Ha -ha. Nice. <laughs> and, Very uh, wise. Yeah, smart guy. Well, obviously, he figured out how to unlock the bootloader on you one of the, one of the hardest devices to unlock the bootloader on. I mean... It's it's a very secure device. 
So, you know, if you want the S4 and you're gonna and you want to put uh, something like Cyanogen Mod, they already have. Uh, you know, I don't know if their nightlies are available yet, but Steve Kondik posted pictures a couple weeks ago with it running on the international or the, the T-Mobile version, I believe it was. So yeah, it's uh, nightlies. If they're not already out, they're going to be coming. So now that the Verizon one can be unlocked, chances are some developer will pick that up. And I'm, I mean, I'm not going to speak for the CM team, but there's a high probability that it'll be it'll be available. And uh, when is that coming? You know, soon. Yeah, always. <laughs> um, look for look yeah, for ten point so two release candidate roughly the time. Jelly <laughs> four point three releases. <laughs> um, oh come on now. So. You know, you know what? Uh, I wouldn't see it taking entirely that long because all somebody has to do is is get a hold of the uh, Google edition of the S4, and then they basically have AOSP for it. You know. Yeah, minus the Verizon parts. Yeah, minus the CDMA. You know, radio. Minor part. detail. Yeah, minus the real. Sure, which we is... can put this ROM on here, but it won't work like a phone. Yeah. Talk. yeah. Yeah, the real is always the pain in the butt. All right, yes. so let's uh, let's talk about some numbers real quick. The uh, Galaxy S4 sells a lot. Uh, we know this. So in the past 25 days, it's less than a month, they've sold 10 million uh, devices, which, yeah, that's a lot. We we know they're going to sell a lot. No surprise, you know. I'm really blown away that there's 10 million people that want that phone. And well, I know they're going to keep selling millions more. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it, the S2 was the number one selling phone. The S3 was the number one selling phone. So obviously, the S4. I mean, they're they're killing it. Um, the yeah, HTC I, I, One. Uh, let's talk about that real quick. They they actually had some supply issues and weren't able to sell as many in the beginning as they had wanted to. They've sold five million, which which is actually a pretty good number if you think about it. I mean, f five million is a is a very nice number for HTC. They should be proud of that. It's a big bounce back from where they were with the One X. Yeah, it's and it's it's doing. Uh, let's see, four hundred ninety uh, or four, yeah, four million four hundred ninety or nine hundred. I can't do math. It's doing a lot better than uh, the HTC first. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, the we first that's already gone down to one dollar because they can't <laughs> can give them away. Well, we we, we didn't expect big things. Ninety thousand. There we go. You don't expect big things, but you don't expect it to drop to one dollar on AT and T on contract like a week after it oh, goes on. A week sale. after it was debuted, a hundred bucks. You know, it's like yeah. I mean, yeah, but uh, I, I think it's kind of cool that. Uh, oh, what was I going to say? All right. Well, you think about it. So, so we all know that H. Nope. We all know that the Samsung Galaxy S four has a Google edition, and we just mentioned. Well, the day that that happened. A Samsung or a HTC employee tweeted, "Hey, you can spend six hundred and forty-nine dollars for plastic dot dot dot, or you can wait." Everyone's like, "Holy shit! The HTC One is getting a AOSP stock Android version." And then HTC execs came out and said, "No, no, 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 that's not happening." Well, wait, no, they came out and said, "We're not building a Nexus device." Yeah, they came out and said, "We're not building a Nexus device." But Samsung which... didn't release a Nexus device either. Yeah, so a lot of people, including us, actually last week, Dan, you actually made that point last week on the show, and we said, "Yeah, they aren't building a Nexus device." So Russell Hawley, uh, he's been on the show a couple times, good friend of mine. He uh, actually broke the news about the. Google edition of the Samsung Galaxy S4 the night before I/O, and everybody uh, basically said, "You're full of shit. You're a liar. You don't know what you're talking about." And then, da da da, he was right. Well, he seems to know what he's talking about. So when he announced today that the HTC One was in fact going to release a senseless version of the uh, One, <laughs> um, I believe him. I think he knows what he's talking about, and he he said that we should see an official announcement within the next two weeks. So I'm going to say if you're looking to buy the HTC One, wait another week or two if you can. Uh, you know there might be some big news coming. Yeah, so, and I, I want to buy one. So so I I have a question here. So that's awesome that HTC is going to do this, and you remember their whole marketing thing is. We have two big things, two big pushes with the HTC One. We have boom sound, and we have this amazing camera. So, how are those two things going to work on nonsense ROMs? I mean, is boom sound going to blow us away and sound is amazing? Maybe, 
But what about that 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 sense camera? There's no way in hell the camera's going to operate the same way. So I'm I'm really curious as to you know how that's going to pan out. What you know, Dan? What do you, what do you think on that? Well, if HTC was smart, and really if HTC, Samsung, any of these companies were smart, what they would do is build the camera app the way they want it and make it run on a stock ROM. Then they just replace the stock camera app. Once they're done with that one, they move on to the next one and continue doing that through all of their custom apps. Oh, and wait, now they don't need a custom overlay at all. Yeah, Plus, maybe they don't need to worry about carriers store. to update. They can do exactly what Google does and release it through the Play Store and lock yeah. it down to only HTC devices. So maybe, so maybe it comes with the stock, the stock camera, and then HTC publishes an app to the Play Store saying, the stock camera is cool, but if you want to get the Sense camera and make it only available to that device... Yeah. No, I yeah mean, no, I, there's I no reason that. why. Google has basically, through I.O., by not releasing an update to Android and just releasing a bevy of app updates, shown we can update our entire ecosystem and platform without touching the underlying operating system. There's no reason that OEMs can't do the same. Yeah. None at all. It's a good point. Roll it into updates. Come on. And good. that takes fragmentation and updates and carrier bullshit entirely out of the equation. Mm-hmm. Entirely so, out of the equation. So speaking of OEMs, do you guys watching, listening, and also in the Hangout right now think that this is going to spawn some type of trend? We have the number one Android manufacturer, phone manufacturer, having a stock Android version. Now it's really expensive, only available in the Play Store right now, Who know, and only available in the U.S., so how many are they really going to sell? But HTC is doing it too. You know, so there's two big name manufacturers doing it, you know, and Sony, they're very developer friendly. Friendly, they've released AOSP for device, you know, various Xperia devices in the past, and as well as the the Tablet Z has AOSP available for it too. So, you know, do you think we could see something coming you know, down the line? Is this is a trend? Uh, you know, devices put out a flagship or manufacturers put out a flagship phone, and maybe they put out a you know, a stock Android version for people that want the hardware but don't want the software. I mean, will LG jump on this trend here? Are we going to see an Optimus G Pro or G2 with stock Android in the near future? That'd be cool. Well, LG already did jump on by releasing the Nexus 4. If you want to put well, AOSP yeah. on your yeah, Optimus G, just non-Nexus device. Though. Yeah, yeah, non-Nexus device. Yeah, but if you have an Optimus G literally take a Nexus 4 ROM and flash it and it will boot. You might lose network connectivity if you're not on, you know, the right carrier. Yeah. And depending on what version you're coming from, you may need to flash some extra partitions, but the Nexus 4's ROM will boot on every other LG. Right? They're identical phones. Yeah. Just from the hardware perspective. So, we so have a, uh, we have a comment there, here. I don't know that I see this becoming a trend with OEMs just because there's not a whole lot of incentive for them to release the devices like this. They aren't going to sell enough of them to make a profit off of it. But what I think they'll realize is all they have to do is publish the AOSP code that will run underneath of their OE, their you know their skin, publish it to the web somewhere, and that's the people who are interested in this, that's all they want is the code, the underlying software. Even if they release it as a packaged ROM without the code, It'd be hugely beneficial to the custom development community. They don't even go out of their way to buy a special AOSP device if HTC or Samsung or LG is just going to release the AOSP software for it. All right, Dan. So uh, we have a um, a comment here from uh, Galen Twenty K, and I think that a lot of people might be feeling this way. So he said, you know, the HTC One is the absolute best phone that he's ever owned, and you guys should really try it if you haven't. So so that brings up a good point. If you do own the HTC One, what are your thoughts about an HTC One, you know, stock Android senseless edition coming out? Are you going to be upset that this was announced, you know, uh, uh, a month or two later? You know, uh, is it going to make you want to get that device, or are you happy with what you have and you you you, you like Sense, you know, five point uh, Let us. If you already have an HTC One, you should not be upset at all. This coming out means that the ROM itself will go into your device with almost no effort whatsoever. Yeah. Another, on the topic of, well, the trends start catching is 100% dependent on carriers because I think the biggest problem with stock 
is not that stock is stock, it's that stock doesn't exist on carriers like Verizon or Sprint. I mean, Sprint, you know, you've had more Nexus devices on Sprint than before, but with Verizon, the only new flagship phone you have right now is a Galaxy S4, and that sucks. I mean, it's yeah. not that if you want a Galaxy S4, that's good. If you don't want a Galaxy S4, you've got no options whatsoever for a new flagship device. So <laughs> yeah. Google releases the S4 Google edition, and what carries it is on, it's on AT&T and T-Mobile, in which both of those carriers you can already use a Nexus device on. So maybe it's a better device, but it's also a lateral move. So until they get these devices on a carrier like Verizon or somebody like that, and by the way, Verizon, we hate you for this, then that's going to be when you know if AOSP can really catch on with the masses because until, you know, it, even when the Nexus has come to Verizon, it doesn't come every single year. You can't reliably say, I'm going to wait for the Nexus on Verizon because you don't know if it's coming or not. Yeah. Now let's uh, let, let's talk about another device here, and which is related to Verizon. So this past week, we saw some more some more leaks and some more uh, confirmations, I guess, about the upcoming Motorola X phone. We saw an X phone with Sprint compatibility pass through the FCC. So generally, that means it's probably coming sometime soon. You know, once it passes through the FCC, and the guys over at Droid Life were able to get a hold of the driver's file from Motorola and by looking at the INI file it mentioned a device that would be most likely Verizon's model number. So I was going to say, you said it's compatible with Sprint but not Verizon. Well, it was the Sprint's, Sprint's radios. So, I can't possibly imagine Motorola being stupid enough to build a device that works on Sprint that's not also capable of working on Verizon. They would uh, have to actively go out of their way to make that happen. Or maybe Verizon doesn't want the device. And the, you know, no, my point is the hardware they're putting in it is going to accomplish those goals. They would have to go out of their way to find some obscure manufacturer who's making really crappy hardware to come up with something that's only going to run on Sprint. Or as doesn't get a choice in it. Remember the at least the SOC that's in there now isn't isn't a newer Snapdragon processor. I, I believe it, it was just the uh, dual core S four. Yeah. Which was it would have been the same processor that was in the Galaxy S three. Yeah. No, I think they yeah, were running the hardware that is capable of simultaneously running on Verizon, Sprint, AT and T, and T Mobile. But my point is, is that there was a Samsung Sprint variant and there was a Samsung Verizon variant, so it's not like this isn't that this is out here. This is this is you know technology. isn't some something outlandish. People have done it before. The radio in both of those devices was identical. That was the carriers pushing their branding onto Samsung. Well, maybe it's going to happen again. I mean, it certainly could. I don't think Motorola has ever released a you know, cross-carrier device like that either. Well, they do have devices that, that, that now have, you know, global, you know, GSM support. Right, right. I mean, a lot of the, the Verizon Motorola's have the global support, but I mean, I don't think Motorola's released a device on multiple U.S. carriers, like, under the same brand, like, the same brand name. Yeah, like, they haven't done Razor what HTC on, um, or Samsung has done. Yeah. Well, well, we'll see what happens here. I mean, obviously, this is just... Speculation based off of some files that show up on the FCC's website. So anything's possible, but we do know that devices are coming. Since you know we've seen a, a Sprint variant and a supposedly Sprint or AT and T variant uh, show up as well. So usually that means things are coming when multiple model numbers of the same phone start showing up. Um, on to devices that we can confirm. Google Glass. If you are an IO12 winner or, or a signer upper, this does not apply to you. You already have your glass or it's being shipped to you. You picked it up already at IO13. Uh, so if you're an If I Had Glass contest winner, this news applies to you. Yesterday, 
Project Glass announced that invites, purchase links are going to start being sent out to winners. And almost immediately after that notice went out, people started reporting, hey, I got my purchase link, I got my invite link. So there's already people that are picking it up next week from the FI Had Glass contest. Uh, so, so, what's that, so what's that mean? You're going to have to... Or did they win the opportunity to buy glass? Oh, you won the opportunity to buy it, yeah. You, it. you won the opportunity to spend $1,600 plus travel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's fifteen hundred dollars plus tax plus travel, but I just you know rounded up to say sixteen hundred. So you can go to L.A., New York City, or Mountain View to pick it up. Um, <laughs> you have to pick it up in person. You have to pick it up in person. You have to get. <laughs> basically, I, I'm I'm thinking that I could be wrong on this, but Google thought that the I/O attendees are smarter than the average bear because they're generally a developer or a tech savvy tech enthusiasts, so they could probably figure out a lot of glass themselves, uh, whereas the If I Had Glass winners are just random, everyday, average Joe people a lot of the times who may not be that tech savvy and might need the hands-on training on how to use it. I'm, I could be wrong, but that kind of makes sense to a me at bit. least. So, uh, so I, I'm thinking that's why If I Had Glass users have to go in person to pick it up. So, and the, the terms of service was updated yesterday to say you can have it shipped to you if you're an IO12, uh, sign up. If you're an If I Had Glass winner, you have to go and, and pick it up. So, John and I, um, Scott, did you win as well? Okay, so John and I haven't gotten our uh, purchase links yet, but very soon we're going to have to decide, as well as many, many of you probably watching right now, what you know? What do you want? Do you want charcoal? Do you want shale? Do you want tangerine, sky, or cotton? You know that. You know if you're deciding to spend the fifteen hundred bucks, that's the next decision to make. What color are you going to go for, John? Mm, heard a lot of people say the shale is nice. You know what? I'm a I'm a fashionista apparently. So I, I start saying to myself, you know what? I want sky because it stands out and it, it's it's purdy. You know, I said I want tangerine because it's it stands out. And it's kind of cool looking. And then I start thinking to myself, you know, orange and blue, you know, tangerine and sky, that those colors don't go with everything, you know, you know, fashion-wise. So kind of limit your wardrobe, you know, you're gonna, you know, it, it, some things could clash. So I, you know, I'm thinking the charcoal and shale, which is black and gray, um, might be the way to go. And then I thought white, uh, but then I don't know if I'm able to rock white though, you know, I, I don't know if that's me. Not after Labor Day. White's just not going to blend that well. <laughs> um, so uh, Google Glass, yeah, hopefully uh, in a couple weeks, John and I will be sitting here doing like Hangout on Airception. We'll be like doing it like in front of the webcam, and then we'll be doing it on uh, on Glass too. Anyway, so, so John, let's not talk about Glass anymore. Let's talk about NVIDIA Shield pre-orders went up, and we didn't have a chance to talk about it last week because we were I.O. and all the things. You want to... Yak about that for a minute. Yeah, they uh, they started May twentieth, which if you order them now, you can get it for three fifty, which is actually a little bit cheaper than I thought they were going to be. I thought they were probably going to target about five hundred bucks, but it's going to ship in June. And if you missed what Shield is about, it's basically kind of like an Android mini tablet as far as the display goes. It's a five inch seven twenty p display. It also has an integral controller, integrated speakers, which the speakers from every reviewer I've seen that's held them said they're actually pretty amazing considering it's a portable device. Uh, the battery in it is gigantic. I mean, it's I can't remember what it is, but it's way more than most tablets have. Um, it runs bone stock Android, and it does come with a, a Tegra 4, so you're going to get the Tegra platform and all the Tegra-optimized, you know, NVIDIA's own games. Uh, but the biggest thing is it links up with a any Kepler NVIDIA desktop GPU, which is a GTK 650 or higher, and you can actually stream your PC games via Steam and play them on the Shield device. So you could play Skyrim on a portable controller Shield device or whatever you felt like playing. I so that's that kind of the biggest to... marketing thing behind it. I get that NVIDIA is trying to push like their own technology with that, but there's 
absolutely no technical reason why you need to have an NVIDIA Kepler GPU in order to stream content from your computer to anything. It'd be interesting to see. You do need to have some kind of a modem. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if you even have a GPU. Or so NVIDIA would have you believe. Yeah. <laughs> the big thing they're trying to sell you to new like cards, GPU yeah. actions to the seat, like, to the desktop computer, which I can't possibly imagine they're doing. They're just trying to sell new things. I can't yeah. remember. There were some parts of it that did require, because Tegra Four is the only one that can do it too. It required some kind of hooks in the capital architecture to be able to do. From the, I don't know if it's from the. If that's, side that's, of things, that is it? really really bad coding. Yeah, it could be. I'm not going to analyze that part of it, but there was some requirement in terms of... I imagine, of course, that low-end cards would struggle to keep up with it anyway. But It'd be interesting, anyway, to see how the device does. I don't, I don't expect it to be anything more than something to appease, try to sell more desktop GPUs. Well, basically. I'll tell you what. It's probably going to be better than the Ouya. That thing, <laughs> I have that thing, and if my three, almost four-year-old son didn't love playing it, I would put it on eBay already. That thing sucks. Um, I will give a full review later. Moving on. Dan? <laughs> yeah, so there's uh, some interesting patent filings this week. Uh, the Microsoft versus Motorola case, which is in two parts, and I've spoken before about the first part of that where the judge arbitrarily decided to set a friend rate because, you know, he thinks he has that kind of power. Um, the second part of that, though, the judge sided with Motorola. I'm pretty sure this is the only time he sided with Motorola ever in this case, uh, but agreed to have the rest of it be heard by a jury trial, which isn't really all that beneficial to Motorola considering the jury pool is pretty much the population of Microsoft employees. So you win some, you lose some on that one. Really, the judge kind of had to side with Motorola because otherwise he probably would have gotten himself into some trouble for just flagrantly violating the law. Pretty much, if any party in any litigation asks for a jury trial at any point, that's the end of the discussion, period. They get a jury trial. That's the way the law works. Once you want one, that's it. That's all you got to do. This case originally started in Wisconsin and then got folded into the Seattle case. And in the Wisconsin filings, Motorola very explicitly and on the record asked for a jury trial. And then Microsoft basically tried to say, oh, no, they didn't. That doesn't matter. Mm, yeah, it really did matter. And so the judge actually sided with Motorola on that one. Uh, the other Motorola case from Wisconsin was the, Motor the Apple versus Motorola case that Judge Posner had heard and tossed out, basically saying, this is a waste of my time. You people don't actually want anything. Get out. Oh, and attach prejudice to that, because I don't want to hear from you again. Uh, so Motorola and Apple are both appealing it on different grounds. And Motorola very recently filed their brief in their appeal of it, essentially arguing that Judge Posner's ruling pretty much says, if you've contributed your patents to a standard, you get no more rights over your patents ever again. There's no infringement. You can't sue anybody, even if they are willfully infringing and utterly and completely refusing to take a license. Like, say, for example, Apple, who told a judge, we really don't care what value you set on these patents. We're still not going to license them. So when you're facing a potential licensee who's utterly and completely refusing to license your standards, essentials, patents, you should probably still be able to seek an injunction against those people, because otherwise, by submitting your patents to a standard, you are making them worthless and useless. So Motorola probably has a, a pretty good leg to stand on on that one. Uh, Apple's appeal is less penetrating and more about whining, pretty much, about how we should be getting more thought and care and money, but not actually putting up any reasons why Posner's decision wasn't valid. Um, in other Apple legal news, the Apple versus Samsung 2 case, which is the one that's mostly centered around search, uh, and they had previously attempted to get injunctions against the Galaxy Nexus over that case, uh, Apple is now trying to fold the Galaxy S4 and potentially Google Now itself into that case. 
so they're really now very much directly going after Google for search. You know, I, because Siri does the same damn shit that Google now does. Right. Because uh, you ask it a question, verbally ask it a question, and it returns results, which apparently Apple forgets that Google search has been doing since Eclair. Well, then you got the fact that Siri was bought by Apple as an yeah. app that existed. After party. Voice yeah, actions have been in Android market. since 2010. Siri was purchased oh, yeah. by Apple in 2011. And Google Now is all about contextual data. Which Siri is not. Siri does but not. Even, even more than that, seriously, Apple is now trying to attack Google over search-related patents. Do you really think Google doesn't have prior art or better patents on search than you do? The biggest search provider in the world, by far, that's what you're going to go after. You're going to go after Google about search, They're not no rectangles and rounded corners and black devices. Search is what you're going to go after Google with. You nibble around the edges and don't go after Google for everything else and all of your other ridiculous nonsense, like invalid bounce back and invalid unlock and invalid this, that, and the other patents. But search is what you settle on is your like missile for Google. That's your thermonuclear war. I'm pretty sure that's more setting off a grenade in your own house. All right, so any other patent news? No, that's really it, just Apple making themselves <laughs> look like fools. I think we have time for some big carrier announcements. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so Verizon had an announcement this week. Uh, at, at CTIA 2013, Verizon has announced a new store partner. Uh, before the event, the CEO said that they're going to have an announcement that they're going to want to tweet about. Everybody was really thinking this was going to be the HTC One for Verizon because because she said we have an announcement you're going to want to tweet about, meaning yeah. it's huge, right? Yeah, you'd think it's big news, something that people are going to be excited about. In fact, <laughs> it was just Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, Jennifer Lopez is nice to look at, but kind of past her prime, though. You know? Not really something that gets me all ready to tweet about. Oh my uh, God, Jennifer Lopez, CTIA, yes! Announced Vivo Mobile, which has social shopping stores for Latinos and stores opening in LA, New York, and Miami. So Why? essentially, it's La Verizon. No. So, so you're going to be able to go to these stores as well as Facebook and do social shopping, and it, it, it's it's for Latinos, which is fine. She thinks it's an untapped market, and that's fine, but. Do we really need a whole entire online shopping store dedicated to that? Yeah, I know a lot of Latinos, and I don't know any of them that are like, oh my god, I was going to get a phone, and I was just so blown away waiting for a carrier that catered just to me. Oh my god, I need Jennifer Lopez cases <laughs> for my phone. Where is my Twitter account? I, I don't know any Latino who's sitting there thinking, god, if only Jennifer Lopez had tried to sell me this smartphone, then I would have bought one from Verizon. Oh my god, <laughs> we should tweet this. Now, what? Now, the, to be honest with you, Dan, the most interesting thing about that is, is she's actually not just a talking head. She's not just a pretty face. She's not just a spokesperson. She's actually a major stakeholder in uh, uh, Viva Mobile. Like it's actually, you know, partly her company. So it's she's actually doing it. You know, which she does I mean, her own clothesline, I think, too. But I, I don't. I just think I don't it was, think there's an audience for the market she's trying to I create. think that Verizon trolled everybody at, and it basically showed that CTIA as the largest US mobile focus conference is dying in dead. I think that's what the message was that Verizon wanted us to tweet. Yeah. Don't waste your breath on CTIA. Because didn't CTIA merge with uh, what did they merge with something else to become Super Mobile or something like that? What's something it called? Like that. Yeah, it was good. it's called like Super Mobile Show. Like, like it's not better relevance, and it failed. <laughs> uh, okay, so more importantly, if you are of Latin descent, and if this made you excited, if you are going to now walk into one of these locations and or like the page on Facebook, let us know because we don't think that's that exciting. Maybe we're maybe we're missing the buck. Maybe, maybe Jennifer Lopez has more 
cool than we think. So let us know. I'm, I mean, I'm actually very curious. more knowledge of what it's like to be a Latino than I do. Yeah. But <laughs> I just don't feel like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint aren't already reaching the Latino community. I don't also think T-Mobile, Sprint, and, and uh, AT&T are like, damn it, why didn't we get in on this? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, at and Because we only own white people for so long. <laughs> Next week, uh, Eva, uh, what's her name? Eva Mendez uh, becomes spokesperson for another. Yeah. Anyway, she becomes um, the new Carly for T-Mobile. Yeah. So yeah, she she becomes the new Carly. All right. So uh, Scott Anderson made his bed. Biggest highlight of the week or HTC One stock Android? You let us know in the comments as well. I'm. That's a tough one for me. I don't know which one's bigger or better. I'm gonna have an ego, and I'm gonna say me. <laughs> well, you know what, Scott? You haven't done it in a while. Let everybody know where they can find us on this vast thing we call the Internet. You can find us at AndroidAuthority.com. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us, uh, you'd be watching us on YouTube. Uh, you'd be listening to us on SoundCloud. Um, SoundCloud, uh, Podbean. It's been a while since I've done this, so I'm a little right. bit rusty. Um, I didn't make any mistakes when I did this last week or the no, week before. No, not a single one. <laughs> I'm just gonna cry now. This is just <laughs> you can find um, us everywhere. You always find us, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. So thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments. Scott Anderson versus HTC One Android Stock Edition. Have a good night. Please. Take it easy.